So when I do these little introductions, it's actually right after I interview my guest. So I kind of think back on the conversation, what's something that sticks out, what's maybe a story I could share to kind of reflect on what I learned to maybe kind of set up the podcast for your listening. And I don't know if this is a story, but just something that kind of resonated with me uh, when I was talking to Adam Terizi, uh, who shares about the intentional educator and the intentional athlete. And it was a great conversation, but he talked about really focusing on fulfillment over fun. And when he talked about that, I was really kind of thinking about how sometimes we sacrifice fulfillment for fun. And here's what I mean by that. Sometimes we'll do things in the moment that are really enjoyable, that we like to do, but in the long term, they might hurt us. They might actually lead to, you know, um, you know, different consequences. And I remember listening to this conversation, uh, hearing this is that um, basically it's like choose your heart when, when, it, when that happens. And, and really kind of thinking about what that actually means. And it's like, if you do hard things now, you know, life can be easier later. So do I make good health decisions that, you know, maybe aren't the most exciting, but you know, are, are beneficial because then, you know, my life could be easier later because I'm not necessarily dealing with health complications and things like that. Or you can make, you know, some bad decisions and then you can have, you know, hard times later, right? It's the same with financial decisions. It's the same with many things. And I think sometimes that fun in the moment could actually take away from the fulfillment. And it's not that they're opposites. They're not opposites, but I think it's, it's kind of thinking about when they happen and the long term, like being fulfilled long term, I actually think is kind of fun, right? But sometimes those fun things that we do right now might not necessarily lead to fulfillment. It's just something I was thinking about after this conversation. And I talked a little bit more about this with Adam. He has so many great points, so many things to think about uh, in education, athletics, and kind of the, the connection of the two. I really enjoyed this podcast. Um, Adam is someone I just met uh, just in the last couple hours. And it was really interesting to talk to his experience as an assistant principal, as a coach. Uh, and he talks about health and wellness. He does therapy uh, as well. He has very different uh, experiences. And I know you're going to enjoy it. I know you're going to get something out of it. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey, everyone. This is George Kroos, another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. And I am very happy to have Adam Teresi. Uh, and you can find him at The Intentional Athlete. You can also find his website. It'll be linked in the description below. And Adam and I have uh, been having a great conversation. We just recorded uh, three questions before this podcast and talked a little bit about, you know, education, life, and just kind of our, our separate journeys. And Adam currently is an assistant principal uh, in the New Jersey area. He does a lot of different jobs, which is like, I don't know where you yeah. find the time uh, to do these things. But Adam, if, uh, thanks for being on the podcast, first of all. Thank I really you. appreciate you taking the time uh, out of your obviously busy day. But also, um, just just appreciate just having the time to talk to another educator, you know, uh, across the across uh, North America. You can, you're probably as far away from me as possible in New Jersey. <laughs> so uh, I, hope, I hope everything well is well and safe there. But uh, if you could just kind of introduce yourself, tell us what you do today and how you got there, that'd be a great way to start. Yeah, sure. And thank you for having me, George. I really appreciate it. Um, so my name is Adam Teresi. I'm a, an assistant principal at William Ann Middle School in Bernard's Township um, in Basking Ridge, New Jersey. Um, I've been in this position for probably uh, eight or nine years at this point. Um, a few years ago, I, um, I was lucky enough to go back and get another master's degree, a master's in social work. And um, and I just felt like, you know, that was sort of like a skill set that was needed in, in today's educational world just to, you know, relate better to some of the mental health issues that, that kids are having. And lo and behold, I, I learned that you could actually become certified by the state to, to do therapy and, and work as a psychotherapist. And um, so hmm. I, I, I did that along the way, too. And um, so now I work part time as a therapist at a practice in Montclair, New Jersey called Montclair Behavioral Health and Wellness. And um, I work there with a great uh, husband wife team, the doc Dr. Uh, Carrie and, and Ron Wasser. And they've been just tremendous uh, leaders and just tremendous um, in, in allowing me to, to pursue that 
that field as well. So I, I work there a um, couple nights a week and I work given my background, mostly with adolescents and, and tap into the mental health needs of kids. Um, and then also what I do is, is the intentional athlete. Um, as you, as you mentioned during the introduction, I appreciate that. Um, the intentional athlete is basically a presentation that I do for um, mainly high school and college athletic teams, um, some certain club teams and training programs I've presented to as well. And I present a mental framework for the athlete. Um, and it's basically, you know, if I had to sum it up, it would be like uh, the the means to get out of your own way. Um, mm. But basically, I, I go through, through a three part framework. It's willingness, rationalization and fulfillment. And, um, you know, rationalization is like the excuse making thing. So that's sort of like the mental roadblocks. And we talk about how to overcome those in the willingness is more about a focus on the process rather than like your product or goal. Mm -hmm. And the fulfillment is more along the lines of your why factor and why you do it. Um, and, uh, it's something I've been doing for, I would say since February, 2020. And, uh, it's just, it's, you know, not to steal my own term, but it's really fulfilling to, to, to work with, uh, teams in that capacity. Yeah. And like, it's not like we need it as a, <laughs> Focus on mental health is like it's kind of a good timing, right? February yeah, 20. perfect timing. Okay, yeah. I wonder if anything's going to happen, you know, for the next month. <laughs> right, right, yeah, right. exactly. Hey, so I, I want to talk to you more about. Um, I want to talk to you more about that. But before we get into that, you know, obviously, mental health is not just a focus for um, students, but adults too. Obviously, right? Like you're seeing a sure. lot of, uh, you know, mental struggles. And I, I, I've, you know, I had had mine in the past. I do currently too. I'm not pretending that, uh, like I'm just in, you know, and I, it's something that, you know, I, I think I, I love that framework that you talk about because I think, uh, you and I, when we were talking about this before, it is kind of helping people find their own solutions. Cause I think a lot of times we become dependent on other people solving our problems. And then right. if you're dependent on that, uh, and they don't, then like, what do you do? Right. And I think the, like the one person I know I can always count on being there is myself. And I have to learn some of these things on my own, but you know, in, in your work outside of education, you know, with, uh, is it, is it Mont Montclair? You said, yeah, Montclair. Montclair how are you, yeah. How are you seeing those connections between uh, student mental health, like what you're doing there uh, and, you know, adult mental health? Uh, you know, I know it's, it's, cliche this day and age but um it, it all it all really circles around covid and mm -hmm. and being isolated right. um you know it, in the mental health practice i as i said i work mostly with adolescents and every parent that calls me within the first two to three minutes mentions the experience during covid and and being shut down um and working with adults um I feel like it's the same. I mean, it's there's it's a little bit different um, in terms of like the, a wider scope of issues, um, just because you have adults that were isolated and, you mm -hmm. know, just the impact of that. But then you also have adults that almost miss the isolation. Right. Um, you know, you, there are people that are struggling coming back to work every yeah. day after having, you know, been in their own home for so long and with their own family and with their loved ones for so long. Um, it is it is a hard transition back to quote unquote reality. So there's there's definitely a lot of overlap and and honestly the it, it's it's just an interesting time to work in a mental health field and in education for that matter because like the entire world as I see it is in a transition um, mm -hmm. and transitioning from being shut down and and from being isolated into you know sort of getting back into the world but not the way you remember it. Yeah, it, it's interesting because like I saw, um, I saw it on Twitter. I cannot remember who posted it, but someone said that uh, for many of the students and many adults, kind of what you're uh, sharing right now, is the issue was not the isolation; it was the reentry. Right? They're mm -hmm. having a lot of struggles with that. And I think about my own context. Uh, you know, before March of 2020, I, I would I would get on a plane probably 10, 11 times a week. And, um, you know, it was so normal to me. I didn't even like, I was just a robot the way that, uh, I, I, I kind of did things and it was so nor like, it was more nor normal for me to be on a plane than it was to be at home. And then, uh, you know, th as things are starting to kind of open back up and I have to travel, the anxiety that I have about getting on a plane is mm. just crazy. And, and I think part of the anxiety that I have is that I have anxiety about it. You know what I mean? I think that it right. starts compounding because you're like, why am I like, this is so normal to me. 
but it's like, Hey, you have to do this test. You have to do this thing. Um, you know, so it isn't like, like you said, it's, it's not like we're just getting back to what it was. We're getting back to some of the things that we used to do, but very different and, you know, some ways very restrictive. And so there, I can understand that anxiety. So like when you're talking about this, like what are some of the things that you've done to maybe help students uh, or staff or both to kind of deal with some of those? Cause I, I like, you know, I'm sure that if you have like the answer, like, <laughs> you know, and there are probably bigger things in this podcast for you right now, but, <laughs> but what are some of the strategies that you've seen that maybe, you know, have been effective, like, cause nothing's effective for everybody, but what are some of the things that you've been trying to implement to kind of help your staff and students through that? There's a couple of things I would say, like the first of which is just um, like psychoeducation, like just learning about your own psychology, learning about the, only, the, the way you think, um, you know, like the anxiety piece, the way you were describing it is perfect. It's almost like, um, you know, if you remember learning back in elementary school, like about a concentric circle where it just like mm-hmm. starts in the middle and builds bigger and bigger and bigger um, and wider. Um, that's, you know, that is an anxiety loop that a lot of people feel. Um, and you know, what is specifically in school with, with teachers and staff, um, you know, I had a really interesting experience. I became the, the interim principal in January, 2020 of my school, uh, of my school year and, uh, or for this school rather, excuse me. And I had that position from January, 2020 till July, 2020. So right like when COVID right. hit, it was right. like, oh my God, you know. Right. Um, but what I would tell the teachers is then and and even now is like, I feel like our greatest flaw is our high expectations because the high expectations are not steady. They're like, they're just ever increasing. And it's like teachers and, and, and educators today feel like they have to be pitch perfect on everything or, you know, you're exploited as, as being incompetent. Mm -hmm. And what I would explain to the staff, and I still do, is like, we can't be afraid to make mistakes. We just can't be. Um, The hard part about that, obviously, is the insecurity that comes along with it. And, you know, maybe like the critique and and how are people from the outside looking in. But at the same time, it's you you can't live in a world where you're not allowed to make mistakes. Right. And and given the, the new expectations surrounded around education, it's, you know, the mistakes are plentiful. Yeah. And like, I, and I, I just want to clarify, because I think it's not that like, we always have high expectations and high expectations aren't a bad thing. But right. it's, ex- we're, it's like, we're supposed to have high expectations in way more things. And that's, I think, I think that's kind of the issue, right? Yeah. And like, one of, the, one of the things I always talk about, so I don't know when you went to school, but people, li- you know, listen to this podcast, some of them went to school in the 60s, some of them went in the 70s, you know, maybe before some of them maybe in the 2010s, right? And I've always said this, the, the length of the school day, no matter what decade you went to school is basically exactly the same, but right. the, the demands go up every single year. And, and it's kind of like, it's like, how can you continuously do this? Right? And like, I, I know this, I don't know what, this is like going to be a whole thing, but like, I always say like, should we be teaching cursive the way we used to teach cursive? Like, do you need cursive? The amount of cursive that I t- learned when I went to elementary school, the amount that we use it, right? Well, you need right. to sign checks and you need to like do this, right? And I'm not like getting into like a cursive conversation right now, but it's like, okay, but podcasts didn't exist when I was a kid. So like, how much time do we get to that? How much time sure. do we get for digital media? And so, so what the expectation seems to be is like, no, you need to teach cursive and podcasts and this and this and this, right. as opposed to like, we need to like kind of make some decisions here, right? Yeah. And I think one of the things that I I think is really hard because, and maybe this is where I'm connecting this. I, I've asked teachers, like people say, oh, we're so overwhelmed. Like there's so much, it's just too much, right? I'll say, okay, tell me what we need to take off the plate. And they, and people have a really hard time saying what they should right. take off the plate because we, we want to do everything. We want to make sure our kids have access, right? Like I want my kids to be able to write cursive too. I know, and it's like, but I also want to do podcasts. So it's like, yeah, do I want my kid not to have that? Like, I, I think that's one yeah. of the struggles, right? Because, you know, in a time where there's so much choice, we become overwhelmed with it. And then we like, we, sometimes we are our worst, worst enemy with this. I don't know if, if that makes any sense or is it connected to it? No, I, I agree. I agree. So uh, I, I really do think like, you know, it's, it's the, 
the idea of taking things away or taking things out of what you're teaching is people are so fearful of it. Right. And it's like, well, it's, you know, we're, we're more tied to the traditional I- ideas than I think we're willing to admit. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I mean, if you look at the world we live in now and you look at like what we're teaching in, in our, you know, in classrooms, like we're, we're, you know, we're, we've evolved a little bit, but certainly not to the, you know, to the, to the extent that the world around us has. And I, I do think part of the thing that's holding us back is, is that just stubbornness to give up on some of the more traditional ideas that we've, that we've been tied to for so long. Yeah. And like, if you, if you think about it, when say March 2020 came around, nobody was like, Oh crap. Does anyone know do cursive? <laughs> Right. Nobody was saying that. They're like, like some of the people, let's be honest, some of the people complaining about kids not being able to do cursive couldn't get on a Zoom call. Right. So it's true. Yeah. So that I mean, might be that might be something. Yeah. I, I mean, absolutely. Absolutely. Right. So, you know, and like please, please don't. I actually oh my God, years ago. So I like this. I'm like a little sensitive about the cursive thing because I actually was on a Canadian uh news network and they, they brought me in as like the anti-cursive guy, right? <laughs> and I wasn't. I was just like, hey, like we need to kind of think about this, right? Do we do we need as much as we used to? And uh, so like no matter what I said, it was like, so you don't believe in curse? No, that's not what I'm saying, right? But then, holy, I'll tell you some of the, <laughs> some of the worst things is when educators are on like, like news and then you see the comments and I was like, Oh my God, I was going to get killed. It was like, it was like terrifying. Cause I was right. like, cause I, it wasn't that I was against it, but I was like, Hey, maybe you need to think a little bit different. You're like, well, you hate cursive. And it's like, I was scared. Like someone was going to like, you know, you know, graffiti in my house in cursive or something. Right. You know, right. that time. So I was I'm a little bit like, Oh, maybe I don't want to use that example. Cause that was kind of traumatizing then, but uh, it is kind of funny to think about now. Uh, so I wanted to ask you, and you, you told, I want you to reshare the story and I know I heard it, but I think it's going to be really powerful for everyone else. Uh, tell, can you share the story that you share with me about, um, your coaching journey and some of the work that you did and kind of like, kind of like why it's, why it matters so much? Yeah. So, um, I, uh, I, I coached, uh, college lacrosse at, um, at Montclair state for, for 10 years. And, um, you know, it's really what inspired me to, to, when I think back to, to start this, um, speaking, uh, side career for, for, as the intentional athlete. But, um, so I was about two years out of college. I was coaching with, uh, one of my closest friends. Uh, we met our freshman year of high school and, um, you know, played lacrosse together, just kind of hit it off. We had a great friendship. Um, we went to college. Uh, I went to Rutgers. He went to school up in Massachusetts and we ended up transferring back to Montclair state the same year played our college lacrosse together and um, we graduated college. And uh, I just remember one day we're down at um, his parents' beach house and, and the phone rings and it was the athletic director at Montclair state. And he had gotten the assistant job at Montclair state when we graduated and I was coaching at like a prep school. And um, the athletic director basically told them that they had let go the head coach and they were hiring him to be the head coach. And he, Mm -hmm. He hung up the phone and was like, do you want to be my assistant? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, so we just started to brainstorm and grind on on how we could grow the program. And, um, you know, we wanted national recognition. That was our big thing that, you know, we thought there were some some areas there that could be developed in the program. And um, so we went after it. And, you know, after nine years, we were ranked in the top 20 in Division three men's lacrosse. We were you know, guys named all American and all these sorts of things. We had all these accolades. We were knocking off top 10 teams. It was just an amazing ride. And, um, you know, all the while we'd been friends since we were 14, our, our wives were friends. Um, you know, our families were tight. And after those nine years though, you know, I started thinking about my own career and I was thinking like, okay, I think it's probably time for me to move on. I've done all I can do here as an assistant. And, um, so I, I started to look around at other college head coaching jobs. I'm in my early thirties and he called me one day and asked me to meet up after work and just said, listen, you know, if there's any way at all, could you please just give me one more year? Can you just stay on staff one more year with me? And he told me that they would, the university would name me associate head coach, which 
in the college coaching world is is a huge thing if you're out there looking for jobs because it kind of gives the the endorsement that you're ready and um that was in the the end of september 2010 and and five weeks later he unexpectedly passed away and um so basically the whole theme behind the intentional athlete is you know, I got what I wanted, my goal to be, you know, have my own program, but it came as a result of the worst thing that's ever happened to me. And um, so then I tell the story from there of that, you know, what happened after that couple months after and the subsequent lacrosse season that we had. And it was a pretty, pretty up and down roller coaster of a ride, um, a lot of accomplishments, but, you know, a lot of challenges of that season. And, um, and it's, you know, really illustrates the importance of that framework that I had outlined a few minutes ago but and that's that's you know it's um it's, uh, tribute to you know your your friend your colleague your coach and um and i think a lot of times i like one of the reasons i wanted to ask you that story is because i think um through our stories through sharing these things you know legacies live on and obviously the impact that the your friend had on you is is pretty profound and uh, i think probably when you think of the intentional athlete probably has his fingerprints all over it as well too, right? When Absolutely, that, right. Yeah. So, so here's here's what I'm going to ask you. I want you to I want you to kind of go into this notion of the intentional athlete and the three, um, you know, kind of the three aspects of this. Mm -hmm. um, but we were talking about this, how so much of this applies to teachers, administrators, because you know, you know, I am going to name this podcast telling you straight up. It's going to be called the Intentional Educator. Okay. Uh, and so <laughs> I know that. Um, when, when you're saying it, I was like, wow, this is pretty, pretty connected to us right now. Right. Like, yeah. I, but you know, as someone who played sports, who's, you know, pretty active, um, I think a lot of the, I think a lot of the lessons that I share in my work are influences of my coaches, influences of, you know, team athletics. And I think there's so much overlap, uh, you know, some of the best coaches, like I always share the story. Um, like I remember going to this coaching clinic. And, uh, you know, being in, involved in basketball and said, you know, when, when you're, one of your kids misses a free throw, the worst thing you can say after they miss a free throw is like, Hey, don't miss the next one. <laughs> right. Do you think I was trying to miss that one? Like, right. is that like the worst form of feedback? Right. As opposed to like giving, you know, intentional feedback and like thinking about, do we ever do that in class? You know, sure. like do kids go out of their way trying to get things wrong. Right. So like telling them they're wrong doesn't help them get it right. Like, how do you, what's the feedback that you give to help them to the next point? So, you know, the stuff that we do in athletics, you know, totally connects. So what's the, what's the first principle that you shared? Uh, that? Willing, willingness. So how do you see that? You know, how do you see that right now in education for a teacher, for an administrator, like how give me an example of that, what that would look like. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, one of the things I talk about in willingness is um, being more focused on the process. And, you know, I'll say something like, you know, s stop, stop thinking in destinations and start thinking in journeys. And, um, you know, as an educator, I, I, it applies probably maybe even more than sports because all we talk about is destinations and all we talk about right. is objectives. I mean, you have to put it in your plans every day, right? Um, right. And it's and and truly we we just we miss the process we miss the journey and the journey and the process is where the connections are made with the kids, um, and it's you know you see it like if you look at like a teacher evaluation or an observation right you have like you have like say just for instance a math teacher I'm not picking on on math yeah. my wife's a math teacher I'm not picking on math teachers but like you know you have like the the curriculum and you're like oh my god I have to get to this point by April and this point by May. And then as you were alluding to earlier, it's like, yeah, but now in your lessons, we want to see like an anticipatory set and we want to see, you know, this, and then you want to get to your, the meat of your lesson. And then you want to make sure you're, you're assessing and you want to make sure, you know, you're doing a formative assessment and then you make sure, want to make sure you have a closure activity. And then it's like, you wonder why you're behind on your curriculum. Right. And it's like, well, why not just stand up and teach and be passionate about the math that you, right. that, that what brought you there in the first place, because before you know, you started your program, you didn't know what an anticipatory set was, but you didn't know what math was. And you, and that's what drew you right. there. Um, and it's more about that journey that day in and day out. And I'd be willing to, to bet that like, if you could stand up in front of a class and just teach the math you love, 
that those kids are going to have a better experience from September to, to, to June or August to May, depending on where you are, um, uh, you know, than you will if, if you hit on every single point of the curriculum and every single point of what you're supposed to do in a perfect lesson. And we, we sometimes lose, like in that, that mentality, we sometimes lose learning along the way in the sense that when people say, like I always say this, there, there is a different timeline between I need to get through the curriculum versus I need my students to learn the curriculum. Those, right. That actually isn't the same timeline, right? Because some people say, look, I taught it. Right. Right. So if they didn't get it, that's their fault. Whereas like when you say I need my kids to learn this, it actually is on a different timeline because that could take a little bit more time. Right. And I think it is kind of focusing on that process more than like, well, I, I got there, but Hey, but your kids didn't learn along the way you got right. there, but like, right. does that, does that really help? Right. Right. And so the, the next point you talked about is rationalize rationalization. Is that correct? Yeah. Rationalization. So explain yeah. that a little bit more and, and how that connects to education. Yeah. So, I mean, like in, in, uh, in athletics, it's kind of like, oh man, the refs, you know, they're favoring the other team or like, mm -hmm. you know, my teammates aren't that good. So, you know, we lost. It's, it's basically like creating the excuse to like avoid the, the, you know, the main point of what you're trying to accomplish. Um, so if you want to go back to, you know, the, the, the example we were just talking about, it's like, all right, well, these kids aren't really understanding what you're teaching. And it's like, well, I got to move on because I have to, you know, get right. like stay, stay in line with where the curriculum needs to be this certain month and this certain day. Um, it's just it's basically a way of of sort of avoiding excuses and being a little bit more direct and deliberate about what you're doing day in and day out and not being afraid of making mistakes. And when you do make a mistake, being able to pump the brakes and say, like, how is this going to benefit me right now? Like, what did I do wrong? Like, let's have an honest moment. As like an athlete and a teacher, I think the one things that that one of the things that really really overlaps is being able to identify your needs and weaknesses. I talk a lot right. about that in the intentional athlete. So, what are your needs and what are your weaknesses, and and can you identify those things? If you're not identifying those things and you're always just focused on your strengths because it's easier, um, and it, and it hurts less and it makes you feel less vulnerable, you're not really growing. You're not really developing. Um, and so that's why where I think the rationalization piece fits in is 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 stop rationalizing and start being a little bit more honest and look at your needs and weaknesses and and where you where you the probably the areas where you're avoiding are probably the areas where that are going to lead you to the success. So when I'm listening to this one, I thought about when I first started um, coaching basketball, and uh, 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 something I always want to do. I, I'll be honest with you, I was more. I wanted to become a teacher so I could coach basketball. Like teaching right. was very secondary to me. Uh, and I actually remember in one of my interviews, <laughs> I got the job. And he's like, we kind of feel like you're more interested in coaching basketball. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> I I'm not going to lie. Right. That's, that's kind of what I wanted to do. And, you know, watching NBA growing up, things like that. And um, I remember uh, there is, so when I first started, I would just yell at the refs, right? If I didn't like something, I'd be just on their case. Right. And, and then, uh, my players started yelling at the refs. Right. And I was like, what are you doing? Right. <laughs> and right. And I'm like, well, we're, like, where are you getting that from? That's not your job. Don't yell at the refs. Right. They're getting technicals and you know, I'm like, stop it. You're being ridiculous. Like, let me do it. Right. Cause I know the line, I know what's the line where not to cross it. And, uh, I remember actually probably about, uh, I was about eight, nine games into my first season as a coach. Uh, the, a ref that I knew, uh, and I knew him cause we, we, I coached against him in football and he was actually a basketball ref and I was yelling, yelling, yelling on his case. And he said, Hey, you know what? Uh, no matter, no matter what you do, these kids are looking up to you. So if you yell at me, they're going to yell at me. If you don't yell at me, they're not going to yell at me. So what, and I actually like I never yelled at a, a ref ever again. Like I never yelled. Now, did I ever talk to them? Yeah. Did I ever, did I ever actually get calls to go my way later? Yeah. Cause I wasn't yelling yeah. at them all the time. Right. And, and kind of thinking about that. And I think it wasn't just the modeling that was really important to me, but it was like, okay, so if I yelled at one of my players for missing a shot, how is it any different from that ref missing a call? There's only certain things I can control. 
And I had to kind of focus on those things. And we actually started playing way better because we were more focused on, you know, supporting one another, being better in the game. And it was like, what can we control through that process? So I, I, I thought that that was like, I wanted to share that because there's times in your life where you have like, someone says one thing to you and you change everything. And, right. you know, I probably could point to three or four of those things. They're so rare, but that was one of them. Cause I was like thinking like, yeah, the kids are yelling cause I'm being a jerk. Like that's yeah. why they're yelling. Right. But right. do you know why I yell is cause I watched NBA coaches do it forever. And that's who I thought sure. it was. Right. Yeah. So you kind of learn from, from that modeling. And so the last one that you talk about is the idea of fulfillment. So what does that mean? How does it look in education? So sure. I, well, what I talk about in the intentional athlete is like your experience is not about fun. It's about fulfillment and, mm-hmm. you know, fulfillment is so much greater than fun. Fun can be fulfilling, but you know, fun will always be there, but fulfillment is why we do this. And, um, I also talk about how like fulfillment is somewhat elusive. I mean, there's people in their lives who never actually truly feel what it means to feel fulfilled and just how great it is that every like sort of sensor in your body is activated and you just feel like, man, this is the most amazing thing ever. Like you just feel like there's a completeness to it. Um, And in education, I, I, I think that that's really the hope that a lot of people go into it with Mm -hmm. and, you know, as sort of, like the, just as reality starts to kick in and maybe it's not even reality. It's just like, you know, there's little questions here and little demands here and make sure you do this and make sure you do that. And all of a sudden that fulfillment is just becomes like, you know, it fades into the background um, and we forget why we're doing this. And, you know, I see we, we, everybody involved in education mm-hmm. knows this every, every year there's more and more demands and, and nothing ever really goes away. Um, and you know, you, you, you see it now where you'll have teachers that aren't even, haven't even been tenured yet. And they're, you know, two, three years into this and they forget why they're here, you know? Um, and I think the fulfillment piece is, could be great because as an educator, and I don't think people talk about it enough because, and you, you know, you hear people say every now and then like, Oh, remember why you went into this? You went into this for the kids. Yeah. I mean, it's a kid, it's a kid based business, but I don't know if you went into to it for the kids, you went into it for yourself, because mm-hmm. you wanted to live a fulfilling life. And, um, you know, I think that that's something that's way too easily forgotten. Yeah, like, so I'm thinking about this, uh, in the context of something that I talk about, I always talk about this notion of administrators talking about data driven, and how I actually think that is very harmful. And because mm-hmm. I actually think that terminology takes away from the fulfillment of why we did the jobs. We wanted to get an education, well, many of us, right? Wanted to get an education because that fulfillment of making an impact, you know, you know, being the teacher sometimes that we see in these movies who, you know, inspire kids to greatness. And then all of a sudden it's like, no, everything's about data. And it's, and it's like, sometimes like it's, you know, cause it's easy for us to say like, you need to find the fulfillment, but then intentionally sometimes administrators, actually take away the, the the things that fulfilled us in the first place right and like right. when i'm when i'm thinking about this too and i'm not saying you do this by the way right? <laughs> maybe i do I know, <laughs> I know you're a minister but i think you know i think about it too is that part of like why did we want to become administrators if you're some some administrators they're i'm being honest they're like yeah. i i really want to control people <laughs> like right. yeah maybe and then maybe that's where they get the film out but your job is to elevate others but if you take away their fulfillment right then you, you're not really doing you know maybe maybe you, you you got you know the things that you needed to show at essential office but is it fulfilling for you right and right. i think you know we, like we always want to develop people that they leave better because of us not worse and i i think like there's something that clicked to me when i when you sh- shared this um kind of fulfillment and fun because uh, dean chereski is a good friend of mine he talks about joy and i think um, he, he talks about kind of the differences between joy and fun because I, I do a lot of things I love that I find very fulfilling and s- sometimes they're just not fun, but I see the long-term value in it. So I can kind of break through that. Whereas I think when I was younger, if it wasn't fun, I didn't care about the long-term. I didn't care about the fulfillment, right? Cause it's like, it's not fun in the moment. Right. right? And I think sometimes like I've been really kind of thinking about um, the difference, you know, how important hard work is versus discipline and discipline 
Uh, like I can work really hard uh, playing basketball, writing stuff that I love. Um, but like discipline is eating healthy to make sure that I, even though it's not the most fun thing ever, but I find fulfillment in you know, taking care of my mental health, my physical health, things like that too. And really kind of thinking about that. So it's, it was kind of like eye opening when you share that, because I think sometimes, uh, we want the, the, the short-term fun, but it doesn't lead to long-term fulfillment. Right. Whereas right. where like, Hey, long-term fulfillment is kind of fun later yeah. right but maybe not right now right is that fair yeah absolutely right absolutely yeah hey so tell okay so can i ask you this question i don't sure. know if this is who is the most famous athlete to come out of montclair there's got like like is there a college athlete i swear i know somebody like an nba player did they From not Mont have like a good like did they not make it to the like a sweet 16 or something like that montclair state um i don't know i know that the maybe i know that the girls basketball team had had uh you know okay. had a couple good years recently um i was gonna say the most famous athlete to come out of montclair state i think is sam mills who was like a linebacker for the saints and for the carolina panthers that's like, right since passed away but yeah he was from from montclair oh, wow. state. okay yeah. so so new jersey like what so here's the here's the tourist question so where you live what's like if i was come to new jersey right now what's the best thing to do in new jersey like where you are i know it's not just one place <laughs> We, I was going to say I'm all over the place. Um, right. you know, I, I just, I think, uh, you know, in Montclair where I, where I, where I work as a therapist, um, and near where I live, I live about a town over from there. Um, I just think like any restaurant you walk into is phenomenal. What, to, what kind of, are we talking like pizza? What are we talking about here? Yeah. Like, um, like there's a restaurant, uh, La Roca. It's a, it's an Italian restaurant in Montclair. I mean, it's absolutely yeah. phenomenal. Um, there's a place, um, um, I'm trying to think, you know, there's a couple good pubs like Egan's, um, you know, they just have a wide variety of food. Halcyon is one of my, one of my wife and I's favorites. Halcyon is like a seafood restaurant in, in downtown Montclair, right near the train station. Um, they just have a really wide variety and choices of, uh, of restaurants in Montclair. And, and it's, it's a phenomenal place to just go out and enjoy the, the, the community. Okay. So everyone, if you're listening, if you need... If you need restaurant <laughs> suggestions in New Jersey, hit up at the intentional athlete. That's right. And just he'll hook you up. I love it. Yeah. Well, hey, Adam, it was awesome to talk to you. Um, I'm really excited for people to kind of hear this. I love the connections. I, and I'm I'm really excited to kind of see um your work evolve because I know that you're you you and I were talking about this kind of connecting, you know, some of this because the the principles are so, you know, important to education. I actually like I was listening to this, I'm like, no better time than right now to kind of think about these things and how important they are. So, um, if, if people, if, if you're listening right now, uh, check out at, you can follow Adam on Instagram at the intentional athlete, get restaurant suggestions too. Uh, <laughs> but also check out his website. It's linked in the description below. Adam, thanks so much for being on the podcast. It was, it was awesome. You, to talk to you today. So ho hope to hear from you soon. And, uh, everyone, thanks for listening. I hope you have a wonderful day. Pleasure is mine. Thank you.